yeah thank you julie and welcome uh, good evening good afternoon everyone from where the parts you have logged in my name is mohit sharma i am the uh, chair of double rsm india branch and uh, again i welcome everyone for the branch webinar today's branch webinar and our today's speaker is uh, mr soni gopal uh, he is the fellow of institutions chemical engineer and chartered member of iosh chartered engineer chartered environmentalist and many more like so he has uh, great uh, 30 years of international risk and safety management experiences across a range of varied sectors multinational organizations as a senior in broad level so he is widely respected within the field of risk and safety discipline for his interpersonal skills project management leadership training development of highly successful training tools and techniques and again there are lots of things it will be continued if i talk on so is like highly uh, like in technology techs in safety things and in 2019 he founded red risk media to share like uh, live streaming events podcast so, and he's also having a youtube page like uh, you may follow him after this session like and definitely with it would be a great knowledgeable thing and experiences you may get out from that videos and in 2020 uh, he was also selected as the top 25 25 risk and safety influencer by hp magazine in 2021 uh, mr soni has received the iosh president award for his outstanding uh, service recognition for supporting and promoting diversity and inclusion across the world via his digital platform so Uh, this was few insights about the speaker's profile and uh, i will speak now about the branch update i will just uh, go through the branch update and then uh, we will uh, hand over to our uh, mr uh, mr soni our speaker and talking about the today's webinar on leveraging digital media for risk management and then followed by q and a session so starting uh, speaking about the branch update uh, like uh, for one for one percent safer bursary scheme I, IISM will hold welcome event in the coming month that is like on Wednesday 15 June and from India total 18 candidates has been su successfully selected for this scheme and congratulations for all those 18 candidates and uh, next like our monthly meeting for this month would be postponed to the next month considering the joining of all the candidates of safer bursary schemes and uh, another webinar we have on 21st April Uh, on the topic of emergency response plan so you may please visit the iism website for more details on the webinar and to register for the events so that's it uh, for today's branch update and uh, i would hand over to mr soni for further continuing the session uh, please uh, mr soni mohit thank you so much for that introduction i feel humble with all the words that you shared uh, about my background there thank you indeed and a very very warm welcome namaste sastrigal to all our colleagues across in india uh, in wirsm and non wirsm because risk and safety management is applicable to every human being on the planet and beyond that um so my my session today is titled leveraging digital media for um risk management and you might think well that's an unusual title because IIRSM is all about risk management what's what's the what's the link to digital media and i think what i'd like to do in this presentation is is to share a journey that i've been on you could say it's been a journey of discovery um there's been a stony ground along the way but i would like you to be a very active uh, participant in this so it's not going to be i don't do death by powerpoint so it's not going to be powerpoint slides forever there will be a few of course to, to to sort of baseline the conversations but please do engage do discuss and just ask away because only by asking do we really learn so again uh, mohit thanks for the introduction i've got a, a first slide here which is really just to talk a little bit about my background i am quite active in social media as some of you know uh, i ha i'm on linkedin just like uh, i don't know 600 million people on the planet and linkedin is rapidly growing so it's a great place to be if you're a, if you're a professional 
I also do social media like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and all the other things. I'm not a big fan of those things, so you won't find me very active in all of those. Certainly, you'll find me very active in, in, in YouTube. So that's a little bit of my background. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. It's easy to find me. It's just Sonny Gopal, and I really look forward to, um, well, just connecting with you. Now, I'm going to start by talking to you about my Digi experience. And, and, re and when I say before 16, I'd like to think it was before the age of 16, but I'm actually referencing before 2016. Before 2016, I was dabbling in technology. I was doing things just like many others were on websites and, uh, you know, you name it, um, computer programs, scripting, coding, etc. But I didn't really have much passion behind it, much enthusiasm behind it. I thought it was just something that would be good to do. So whilst I was doing a full time job, of course, I had people who could help me. And then in 2016, when I left BP, I looked back upon my uh, sort of what I've achieved. And I realized after 50,000 pounds being spent over a five, 10 year period, I had nothing to show for it. Nothing. It was empty. There was a website that looked like uh, as the expression goes, a dog's dinner. Um, it was it was pointless, just full of endless uh, nonsense, basically. So it's time to take a bit of a sanity check for me. And I'm really talking to you about my Digi experience. It will show you how the journey has evolved. So between 16 and 18, 2016 and 2018, I took some time out to do some reflection. I realized that the only way things are going to get better for me is to take control. But taking control is a very daunting task if you're not used to technology and what's involved. So the only thing to do is really just dive in because you can't really go wrong. It's a learning curve, just like everything in risk and safety management in life in general. But you will learn as you go along. Then in 2018, you've heard the expression hello world. That was that was my moment to say hello world. So after nearly two years of learning digital media, and that includes audio, visual, uh, coding, Java, you name it, I've, I've learned about it in one way or another. And thank God for YouTube, uh, because you, there's a lot of people out there who d do share valuable uh, information uh, and knowledge as they're going along. So this presentation is all about how I've encapsulated all of those learnings and leveraging digital media to uh, help with risk management. Now, a lever, we all know what a lever is, okay? It's a way of getting some sort of um, uh, bias in a certain direction in terms of movement with some uh, force. Um, we all use levers now in digital media. We are prolific in a lot of social media. We use social media like Twitter, LinkedIn, so, you know, all the other things. We use that as leverage because it's a great way for us to build our profile. So, People all across the world now can connect with everyone else with many, many channels that are available. There are problems, of course, we all know that. Nothing ever comes without these uh, uh, problems, but it's just a case of managing them. But the point here is that you are all leveraging right now on digital media anyway, whether it be for personal reasons or whether it be for your organization in terms of risk management. So when you think about risky stuff and you want to think about, well, how can we leverage with digital media for uh, risk, me uh, risk management? You've got to ask the question, well, why do it? What's the point of using digital media? Some of you will say, well, that's a bit of an obvious uh, question. Answers are pretty obvious, you know. Uh, yes, they are. Number one, it helps the communication. Okay. It helps people like me communicate with you know, folks like yourself who are miles and miles away from me. It helps in every form of communication. It also helps in terms of support. There has not been a more greater opportunity and a, and a need than right now on this planet to get support, whether it's for health and well-being or whether it's for risk and safety management or educational, anything. It certainly is a great opportunity to get the support that you need through digital media. But there's, no, there's a couple of other pieces. It allows us to have community engagement. What we're doing now is engaging. We're doing this through digital media and we're creating a community within IRSM to have this engagement. And as a part of that engagement, what we do is we develop the community as well. Developing a community is very, very important. And I'm a very passionate advocate on this when it comes to risk and safety management. Because 
by developing a community, by engaging the community, you create a culture of belonging. So with that culture of belonging, we know now from all the years of experience that we've got and all the different studies that have been done that we keep talking now about diversity, inclusion, equity, and that sense of belonging. So there is no doubt digital media plays a pivotal role when it comes to creating a culture of belonging. Of course, there are going to be tribes that are going to be created and tribal wars are going to be happening. Some will say black, some will say white, some will say green, some will say green, yellow. These, this is inevitable, but it's a part of the rich tapestry of digital media and how to use it. Let's take a bit of a pause here now. So I gave you a big, bit of a brief introduction on what digital media is like, my journey, and what the mission is. The mission is to create that culture of belonging. I've got a poll, a question that I've got for you, basically. And my question for you is, think back about a time where, what is the earliest memory that you've got on something? Think about that one. And think about why you had that particular memory. What triggered that memory? And I think the poll has just opened up now. Um, and you can actually have a look at that poll and respond to it as to, what caused that memory to be evoked? Was it because it was something that you read, something that you heard, something that you saw? Maybe you had practical experience of it. Okay, so have a, have a quick go on that poll, and I believe it is running in the background now. Mohit, is the poll running? Uh, yeah, poll is running, but uh, like how to select it? It is not uh, selectable. The options are not selectable. The oh, questions and answers are there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, in in effect, you should have had a choice of an answer. It could have been any one of those, like something that you've experienced, or something that you've read, or something that you've heard, etc. So, if that poll isn't um, functioning, it's not a problem. These things happen in digital media. I call them gremlins. So we can move away from there, and I'll explain why I asked you that question. Okay, Sonny, the, yeah. the poll is running, and people are voting. Ah, right. Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry, Julie. I couldn't yeah. see it here at all. Okay. Let me um, let me close the poll. Okay, so the results of the poll are 33% read or heard about it, 33% okay. physical contact participation experience, and I can't remember, I can't read the rest. Is it painful That's memory? That's right. That's fine. And yeah. 33% all of the above. So I split straight down the middle there. Wow, that's an interesting <laughs> set of results. Yes. Okay. Great, great. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, that's very interesting. So what I'll do is I'll flick back to the screen and I'll explain what the logic was behind that. Uh, am I good to go on the slideshow again, Julie? You are, yes. We've got your presentation running. Okay. So we all learn things every day. It's it's a part of uh, of part of our growth phase, and I want to talk to you about the learning bias. Right from the the moment you step into the world and to where you are now, you've learned things, you've experienced things, etc. And there is a thing called learning bias, and this is really particularly important when it comes to safety and risk management as well. So here's the tie-in with digital media and risk management, and you can see on this slide here that this is called Edgar Dale's Cone of Experience. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. I'm, I'm not sure. But what Edgar Dale uh, referenced is he said that if you do anything like reading or hearing all the way through to doing a presentation, there is a split in terms of retention and how you learn things. So, for example, when you read something, you have a recall of 10 percent of what they read. And if you go to something down, you can go to watch a demonstration or attend exhibition sites that are 50% of what they see and hear, they've, they've retained and they can recall it. And right the way through to 90% of what they do. So when, when someone responded with, well, it's an injury that I had and I remember it really well, it's a painful experience, that, that is a very powerful recall process in the gray cells. And that's, that's probably where 90% of it is coming from, okay? But 
others who say, well, it's something that I read. It must be something that you've remembered because later on in life, you reinforce that learning with something else, something that you've uh, had practical application with or something that you've seen someone else do. So whilst we can have some memory retention with things that we've read, they usually reinforce at a later stage towards the other end in terms of practical application or uh, you know something that you've watched, etc. Fundamentally, Edgar Dale's cone of experience is very valid because it's saying that the more you have physical experience of things, the more that you are observing things, the greater your retention powers on there. So thank you for taking part in that poll. And that spread is really not uncommon. It is actually quite a common set of uh, statistics that you do see. There's a little bit more bias towards people saying, well, I remembered that because as a child, I remembered smelling this and I remembered that and so on and so forth. But learning bias, there are two types of learning processes. One is called active learning and one's called passive learning. And you may be familiar with this. These bits are really important when you think about risk and safety management, wherever you are and whatever job you're doing, because you're in a position to try and influence things or change things, the dynamics or the behaviors of individuals. And that requires some sort of a learning process. And the learning processes can be active or passive. Active is where there's dynamic interaction and participation. And passive is mostly promoting receptive skills like listening and reading. So you can see where that is on the, on the Dale, uh, uh, Edgar Dale's cone of learning there. Let's break that down a little bit more into a thing called the learning pyramid. And on this learning pyramid, you can see how Passive learning is split from active learning. And active learning is right down at the bottom here where you get teaching others, practicing, doing discussions, anything from 50 to 90% active learning. And then you've got the top end of the pyramid, which is all about lectures, reading, audio visuals, et cetera, and so on, which is passive learning. I remember when I was at university and I'm, I'm not a great reader and I remember I, have to, I had to read things in chemical engineering and I found it extremely, extremely boring on occasions and it never, it never stayed in my head. But what I did uh, learn, what I did retain was when I had to do problem solving and that problem could be anything to do with uh, you know, designing a heat exchanger or something else. I retained the small details there and I was able to recall it, even many of those even to this day now. So it, to me, it just reinforces the, the, the part of active learning there. I am also very confident in saying that I think many of you in the risk and safety management world will be very familiar with hierarchy of controls. Every time we do some risk assessments, we talk about hierarchy of controls. And in the hierarchy, we have all, you know, a, a, a very favorable option to a least favorable option. Very favorable, of course, is illumination. Getting rid of the, the hazard in the first place is the best way forward. But of course, we don't always have that luxury because of you know, um, economic needs or social needs, et cetera. So the other option is to go down to the least favorable, which is PPE. As you know, COVID, you know, when COVID broke out, we all went to PPE as a resort, you know, the masks and various other things. It's not the ideal hierarchy of controls, but under the circumstances, it was the one that was uh, best available. We couldn't eliminate COVID at that stage and we're still struggling with it now. So think about the two types of learning that I've mentioned there. And this is risk management in mind again, active learning and passive learning. If I, if I was to ask you, well, where do these fit? Where do these fit on the hierarchy of controls? What would you like people to have as a learning process to make sure that you have better risk management or hierarchy of controls in place? Uh, you may have already answered this now, but you can see that active learning sits very high on the elimination stage uh, or phase, and passive learning is probably the least effective. Well, why? Because active learning means memory recall is significantly greater, and therefore there is a chance that person, that individual will think twice, three times, four times before they do something and before they expose themselves to that potential risk. Passive learning is those that you know people have and they'll probably remember it after the accident or the incident. They say, oh, I remember now back 10 years ago, I shouldn't have done that. So 
I would certainly say if you're taking any sort of risk management approach in an organization, go towards the active learning side because that's where you can get real value in terms of change and culture change, behavioral change, etc. Quick overview on learning pyramid there and hierarchy of controls. But it doesn't just stop there. Another thing that comes in that I want to talk to you about is called the VARC model. VARC, if you're not familiar with it, is really picking up again on the, the learning process. And you can see here that I'm emphasizing learning continuously because the bridge for me between digital media and risk management is the learning process. So the VARC model really stands for V being visual learner, A is auditory learner, R is reading and writing learner, and K is kinesthetic learner, hands-on, okay? VARC, okay, we now have something that we can think about. Think about the picture I showed you earlier with the lever, okay? So if we go back to that lever and we say, right, okay, I want to use VARC as a model, and I want to lever on that to manage risk for me. So what can I have? What can I use in my toolbox to help me manage those risks using this VARC concept, this VARC model? I'm sure that, again, some of you may have heard this SAAS acronym. Apologies, acronyms, they're all over the place. You can never avoid them. So the SAAS, SAAS uh, model uh, or package, if you're not familiar with it, it stands for software as a service. In the last five years, we have seen an enormous growth um, as people go more into cloud land and they start to create packages and clouds and virtual things where they're using software as a service to create hives, to create intelligence, etc. And this is where you can really get a lot of benefits if you want to think about applying the VARC model, getting leverage for risk management. Yeah, I hear you say, do I need to be an IT expert? No, you don't need to be an IT expert. The whole premise of SAAS, S-A-S-A-S, is that you are, as an end user, empowered, more than capable to do many, many things that in the past you would have had to pay a fortune for to get some coding uh, skills or someone with specialist skills to do that for you. We've come a long way in terms of digital media in just a short period of time where Joe Schmucks like me are more than capable of putting together SAAS packages to deliver content, to deliver technology, to deliver knowledge to the public out there more efficiently than some super big organizations, especially if you're nimble. If you're nimble and you can make those decisions quickly, you can certainly do it. Yeah, I know coding up to a certain extent, but I don't use coding. I know how to create websites, but I don't really create websites because this SAAS package out there will do it for us. If you're doing it for yourself, fantastic. If you're doing it for an organization, also fantastic. But bear in mind, organizations are very particular, there's firewall issues, etc. So you can literally get around those if you think that a certain package is good. Now, I don't want to leave you with a whole load of PowerPoint slides and give you a nice sort of uh, spiel about what I do in terms of leveraging digital media risk management, because I also want to tell you about practicing what I preach. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the sense that don't really share anything unless you've actually gone through the VARC model uh, and experienced it yourself and learned the hard way. And then you can uh, then share with people your learnings so that we are more enriched for it overall. So my journey so far is something that I want to share with you. And I'm sorry, this is a little bit sort of me, 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 but I couldn't think of any other way of putting it across. This is just me openly sharing with you some of the things that we've done. So go back, 2018, I got my hello world approach. And then across 2019, polished it up a little bit more. COVID came along in 2020, we all became in lockdown mode. And it became a great opportunity for me to start using some of those skills. So I started off doing live events. And in 2020 and 21, I think I did about 
maybe 200 live events all on risk and safety management related topics. And you can see up here, we have our colleague here, Subash, who's also a guest on the show. We did safety in Bollywood. Thank you for that, Subash. We've had Jimmy Quinn, the president of uh, IOSH on there. We've also had Clive Johnston, the IIRS and president, and a few other very, very notable, distinguished uh, uh, world-class experts like Scott Geller, Tim Clark, and Chris Payne from Nibosh has also been a guest on my live event shows. They were fantastic because, you know, a lot of people wrote to me and said, um, I'm finding it very difficult during lockdown to engage and to network. So these live events were a, an opportunity for them to create a community, to develop a community with us. And we supported each other and helped each other along the way. Things have moved on since 2021. And in 2022, we've stopped live events to the extent that they were because the thing about digital media is constantly evolving. Every day it changes and every day you have to create a new set, set of things. So we realize that with live events, we've reached the top in terms of doing those. And so we need to find other more creative ways of doing it. And that's the key thing about leveraging digital media. You need to constantly think about creativity in there as well. So what else have we done? Well, we've also got an academy up and running. Uh, got lots of free material on there. We do this in a, in a sort of charitable way because we believe that um, risk and safety management shouldn't be shouldn't have a dollar value assigned to it, although companies do in terms of loss of life. It should be seen as a way of imparting knowledge for the betterment of individuals' lives. So when you go onto the Academy site, we've created checklists, courses, quizzes, and also tools that you can readily access without any, any sort of uh, payment upfront for any of these things. Academy is where the free stuff is. So you can learn from all the other things that are provided in there from other people as well. The other examples are, well, we've, we've leveraged digital media in creating an app. The app is also free. Uh, again, we disseminate information and knowledge through there. And of course, there's a YouTube uh, channel. How has this also helped with organizations? Well, organizations started to come to us, some of them, and said, and said, look, we want to try and use digital media in a certain way because we're not reaching certain parts of the world because of language issues or communication issues, et cetera. And so L'Oreal is a client of ours where we've helped them in terms of creating internal podcasts, uh, online uh, sessions focusing on key technical issues like risk management, ergonomics, um, uh, safe at work, safe at home, et cetera. So they've been very, very forward thinking in terms of coming forward and saying, this is how we want to do it because we believe there's a great opportunity to, to uh, leverage on that digital media. Um, I, I would say that there are lots more organizations now who are involved with this. If you, if you read the uh, the national papers or the magazines or global publications, there's a lot of uh, big banking houses, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, McKinsey Brothers are all moving towards saying, you guys work at home from now on. We're going to use digital media to leverage in terms of financial matters, risk management, safety, et cetera, et cetera. So watch this space. That's rapidly growing. Um, other things. Of course, you know about virtual training. Um, training is very interesting. It's a very growing market. You have online training where you, you know, CBT, computer-based training, bit yawns will, people fall asleep, you know, doing those things. It's not really engaging enough. So we have virtual training where you have a presenter at the end presenting content technically using a multitude of SAAS tools like Slido, CrowdParty, Mentimeter, Padlet. You, there's loads out there now. They create gamification. They allow people to increase their learning capabilities by pushing them down the triangle to active learning. So by actively taking part in these things, they're reinforcing the learnings that they've got, understanding how to do risk assessments or risk identification, et cetera. Fantastic opportunity to use and to leverage. Last but not least, I think, is the fact that we have a newsletter. The newsletter is on LinkedIn, and uh, it's a great, again, a great opportunity to digitize to leverage on digital media and share a lot of the things that we have got going on 
it's not about me it's more about everybody who wants a say in it it's about people who feel they have something to say but they don't ever get a chance to say it because the watching hole is uh it's just surrounded by a group of people who just seem to dominate it digital media means you can break that watering hole down make it your own watering hole and uh you can you can share openly your your experiences and, and your knowledge on a final note um is this um triangle I suspect you've seen it before it's maslow's hierarchy of needs and my journey certainly continues uh in this because uh, a lot of the time I, i'm a big fan of uh, maslow uh, he died in 1970 and the story is that as he was getting closer to the end of his life he suddenly had this epiphany he suddenly realized that he'd missed something on his triangle You've probably seen this triangle where he's gone up to self-actualization, this piece here. But as he got nearer to the end of his life, he said, I made a mistake. I forgot all about self-transcendence. That's helping others, spiritual experiences and so on. My journey continues in the sense that I'm literally at a point where I'm trying to do all I can to get to that next phase. I don't I don't do it for monetary gains I do it basically because I think we do need it I think it's an important thing we all throw statistics around from the World Health Organization about how many people die every year and all the other things grim stories but I think it's time that we actually started to contribute leveraging digital media for risk management safety management and uh, anything else that we can do in terms of improving health and well-being as I said, I don't do death by PowerPoint. It's just a few slides that I want to share with you about 27, 28 slides. So I'll, I'll literally wrap it up by saying from my side, thank you so much for listening to me. And I hope that didn't sound a bit sort of look at what I do. It wasn't the intention. The intention is to share with you what we can do, what we can do with digital media. And if a uh, little old person like me, you know, doesn't have a multi-million pound organization can generate all this uh, I'm sure anybody can if uh, if you're given the time, the commitment and uh, a need. If you have a, a gap that you need to fill in terms of sharing learnings, check it out. Check out SAAS. Check out some of the powerful stuff out there. Unwrap the box, uh, unopen the box, and uh, you, I'm sure you'll find an enormous amount of success with it. So I'm more than happy to take any questions that you've got. Let's take it in any direction you want. I have absolutely no problem. If I don't know the answer, I don't know the answer. Okay, maybe some of you will know the answer. But let's let's have a real positive conversation and see how we can get that fire going again, get that enthusiasm going again with the double IRSM for uh, leveraging on digital media for risk management. So thank you very much for listening patient to me. And I'm hoping Mohit will come and join me in a minute. And uh, fire away with any questions that you've got. Yes, I have a question for you here. That was a fascinating presentation. Thanks so much. So the question is, do technologies have a positive effect on personal safety? And how do can we use technology to improve employees' behaviors? That's a good question. So do, yes, well, you know, it's a bit like a car in the sense that you have people who drive cars badly and people who drive cars brilliantly. I think a technology like SAAS can be used very powerfully, very effectively to educate, to change behaviors, to change learnings and to reinforce learnings. But of course, the message is in, in, the, in the nitty gritty. If the, if the person who's delivering that message is not capable of delivering it articulately, it's the wrong sort of message, etc. It's so easy also to lose confidence. People will say, oh, God, it's propaganda again. Yeah. So I think the important thing is to not push it down people's throats, but get them to come into it to make them realize that you're building a community, you know, a hive, so that they can literally gain benefit from it. Uh, create that culture of belonging, basically. So uh, does that does that sort of help, Julie? I think so. Yes. Um, I don't have any more questions. Mohit, do you have any questions? Uh, no, like uh, this session was so brilliant. Like definitely, I enjoyed it, and I hope the other people members would have done. And yeah, technology like it plays a very vital role. Yeah, in coming times, and definitely, uh, like as we go ahead in our journey in the field of HSE. 
so it is more important to relate and engage with more technologies thing techy things so different it will uh, simultaneously help us to improve our uh, working standards methodologies and the main purpose passion behind being a safety practitioner so mm -hmm. i really enjoyed it and i hope our all the members would have did the same and thank you like uh, literally thank you for the oh, wonderful pleasure. insights you have given me as to us all the members Mm -hmm. and uh, we were uh, happy and uh, lucky to have you on board for this session thank you Mohit. let me share one example with you where i think it made a, yeah. a significant uh, difference so we we have a risk uh, equation in, in we all know what the risk equation is it's the product of consequences and likelihood and when i first started doing this there's all sorts of views as to what consequences are all sorts of views as to what likelihood is there was confusion between the different terminologies like safety and hazard and risk and it was just it was just a mess i think okay now i'm not saying that we are doing stuff that is stuff that is pioneering what i'm saying is you can find out with these tools now by getting your fingers really in there and playing around with things like potential scenarios and figure out what it is so it's so easy to write uh, a very, very small um, package based upon uh, risk equation. And you can say, well, here's an example. This is what's happening. What do you think the consequences are? What do you think the likelihood is? We can all do that. But what, what some people find difficult is translating those two to come up with a risk value. You know, is it high risk, medium risk, risk or low risk using the risk assessment matrix? So we can now go from looking at consequences and likelihood to looking at the risk potential with SAAS. And it's so easy because you just plug in the details and it comes out with the with the risk value. But you don't plug in the details like some chimp, you know, putting in and hoping it'll come out with an answer. You physically get involved in picking things. And in that, in that picking process is where the learning happens. The person understands, well, why did I pick that on the matrix? Why did I pick this on the matrix? Oh, I now understand why this risk is this. Now, this is at a pretty low level, and I apologize. I'm sure all the risk practitioners out there thinking, God, Sonny, that's easy peasy, all right? But there are a lot of people who just don't get it. Okay. And those people are, unfortunately, some of them are in pretty significant positions. Okay. So Julie's question earlier is very, very, very valid. They start to tell you what it is without them actually having understanding of it. But they will then say, oh, what is that you're using? And secretly, they'll go away and they'll play around with it and they'll understand it because nobody likes to learn things uh, in public because they feel that they're not smart enough, okay? So you can take these things away and learn things in privately and come back smart. <laughs> and that, and I think that's one, of the, that's one of the big benefits. True. Um, but I just want to share that with you, that we, we did find it quite interesting when we were involved that there were some very big heavyweights out there who had no idea as to what, what risk actually was, you know? Uh, okay. In fact, financial people had a better understanding of it than some of our... Uh, professional safety colleagues did because for years we've just talked about safety you know in the uk and suddenly we're now right. since since covid we don't talk about safety in a big way it's all risk you know covid has brought out the risk word in a bigger profile exactly rightly said like uh, it's oral in a broader manner it's like all about risk in different different aspects segments so yeah yeah well said yeah. Yes. and okay. um Sorry, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, we've got one more question coming, if you've got time for one more. Sure, of course. So when people talk about risk perception, does technology help to improve that and at what extent? Mm. Yeah, well, risk perception is an interesting one because if you ask someone who's risk aware, sorry, risk averse, and you ask someone who's risk neutral and you ask someone who's risk seeking, they all have different ideas of what that risk is. OK, um, I think the thing that you've got to do is bring it down to back to basics. And if you get all three, if you get three people in the room, one one averse, one neutral, one seeking, and you say, look, guys, we all have different views. OK, but this is what we're going to use as our baseline. And then you can then, if they come to agreement, come to consensus on that, you can build whatever tool you want so that the perception is the same thing, 
Yeah, they they will. Of course, there's going to be arguments afterwards. You know, there'll be some subjectivity. Someone will say, "Well, I don't think that person will fall down. That likelihood is too high. I think they will fall down." You can have all those nuances of discussions, but that's where the wisdom of crowds come in. Those discussions are good. They're positive discussions. It's no longer a case of, "Well, uh, I think we should go for it. That's risky. Uh, it's not low, high risk, not low risk." Is Perception really comes from starting with a baseline based on all the people in the room who've come to an agreement on what it is. And then you build upon that in terms of trying to uh, address the risk in question. Do you address the consequences or do you address the likelihood? Chances are you go towards addressing the likelihood and that's what we should try and aim for. Consequences with that risk are gonna be the same. You're just gonna try and reduce the likelihood um, as much as you can. Um, very interesting question on risk perception. I'm, I'm going back to the conversation that I had with Mohit where I said, well, we had some people very high up in, in companies who had no idea what the difference was between safety, hazard and, and, uh, and risk. So, yeah, perceptions. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful you've given me this time to talk about a topic which I think is a bit of a curveball when it comes to risk and safety management. But you will see there's a connecting line between the two here and that I'm not talking about IT and I'm not trying to say you should be an IT geek. What I'm saying is as an individual, you are empowered. You have the capability now to use this technology to really help in the organization to not only work smart, but also to achieve what you want to achieve with those key performance indicators in mind as well. Exactly. And uh, now it is like, yeah, definitely working smart and with all these technological things, techy things is, is what required transformations. Like earlier in the 90s and other uh, decades, like it was completely different. But yeah, now COVID also like uh, it has taught us many things. In our in one of our sites also, like we have invented online submission of digital tool kind of thing. So like with the help of mobile, people can scan the code and they can submit the observations. So yeah, the trend is changing and uh, what you rightly said is uh, to work smart with the help of these uh, parameters and other thing. So yeah. Make it fun though, don't make it stale. Uh, and, and you know, try, try and build into it gamification. There are two things that are coming down the, the track which are going to be totally revolutionizing the world of digital media when it comes to risk and safety management. One is immersive technology or ocular technology. Uh, I've got a company who contacted me saying, would I like to buy shares in their company because they'd like to do some safety things and could I advise them and so on. I thought, that's not a bad idea, but I don't want any shares, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think it's a fantastic opportunity because we're going to become more and more and more behind desks, okay? And how can I tell someone what it's like to be on a refinery just by talking? I can I can show them right, through right. ocular technology what it is. We've got TV programs in the UK now where they're designing gardens with uh, ocular or immersive technology. It won't okay. be long before companies start to do this in a big way, okay? and gamification to include games which reinforces learning. We all start off as children learning things through games. Why does it suddenly have to stop when we become adults? We can learn things, more uh, cerebral things uh, through games. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Well, I could go on and on and on, as you know. Uh, I love, I'm very passionate about digital media and I'm very keen to, uh, keep uh, the, the fire burning behind it but thank you so much for uh, allowing yeah, like, me to present yeah some, some other some other day if you like to talk on something uh, technology part the application or something in which is uh, relevant in the risk management and which can be implemented so that would be again great some of the life something and uh, the, yeah. again, we can some another day we can have a look on yeah, I mean, if, if bandwidth allows, so, we could do it. We can actually do it with games. Uh, we can create something with one of the things like Kahoot or Mentimeter or Slide or whatever, where people actually get involved. So, for instance, we could do something on uh, preliminary hazard uh, uh, analysis, or job safety yeah. analysis, or hazards, or whatever, and then we can we can talk through the process that's involved. Right. And we can we can get involved with that as well. That's fantastic. Thank yeah, you that so much. That would be great. Sounds great. Yeah.
thank, thank you, you very so much, much Sunny, and thank you Mohit for chairing I think your mm -hmm. sound is going a little bit and um, we don't have any more questions I'd like to thank everyone for attending also okay. and, and to let you know that at the a couple of days after the presentation we will upload the recording onto the iTube the double irsm youtube channel after the event so thank you everyone and good evening thank you julie thank you Mohit. take care everybody uh, thank out there you once again to our speaker and yeah yeah thank you uh, for you